Welcome to CON 205, Securing Your Amazon EKS Applications Best Practices. My name is Jeremy Cowan, and I am a Principal Solutions Architect for Containers at AWS. For today's session, we're going to start by looking at how you solve a problem like containers. Uh, we'll then have a look at the shared responsibility model and the impact uh, of the shared responsibility model. Uh, and then we'll follow that with a set of best practices for securing your Kubernetes environment, uh, starting with hosts and then moving on to securing your container images, looking at uh, pods uh, and uh, securing uh, pods at runtime. We'll then look at uh, how you can do auditing and forensics within a containerized environment. We'll have a quick look at uh, compliance. Uh, and then we'll finish with network security. I also have a brief demonstration of security groups for pods uh, that I'll show you before we conclude, and I'll leave you with a few parting thoughts. So let's begin by looking at the challenges that are posed by containers. Unlike virtual machines, which virtualize the x86 instruction set, uh, containers are processes that are run on a shared kernel. And isolation, such as it is, uh, is implemented by Linux namespaces and C groups. Uh, and unlike virtual machines, containers have a relatively uh, short lifespan. Uh, they typically last only a few days or hours, whereas virtual machines can last uh, months or perhaps years. Uh, <clears throat> now, a lot of uh, traditional uh, legacy security software uh, is not container aware. Uh, this includes things like firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, uh, data loss prevention systems, uh, along with forensic tools. And uh, because of this, uh, security within an environment like this really warrants a different approach. All right, so let's now have a look at the shared responsibility model. Now, the shared responsibility uh, came about uh, to illustrate uh, what you as a consumer of a service, a managed service, are responsible, responsible for, uh, and what uh, AWS, uh, as the provider, is responsible for. Now, with EKS, AWS is primarily responsible for the management of the Kubernetes control plane. This consists of a variety of different components, like the API server, the controller manager, the scheduler, along with etcd. Um, and AWS can also manage elements of the, uh, the data plane. Now, with self-managed worker nodes, you are completely responsible for uh, management of those worker nodes. Uh, this includes orchestrating how those nodes are rotated uh, when there's an update to um, the operating system or say the, the kubelet. Uh, now the flip side of all this is that you have uh, full control uh, of all aspects of the, of the data plane. When we move to manage node groups, AWS assumes additional responsibilities. So for example, with managed node groups, you can call an API uh, to rotate your nodes. Uh, managed node groups also give you the flexibility to bring your own AMI or to customize uh, the launch template that is used to create uh, new worker nodes. Now, uh, you still have uh, a lot of flexibility with managed node groups, but there are a few constraints. Uh, for example, uh, today you're not able to use uh, spot instances with managed node groups, uh, and it's not as easy to uh, taint nodes as they're being bootstrapped. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, Fargate. So, so Fargate, uh, with Fargate, um, the concept of a node is abstracted away, and AWS becomes responsible for uh, managing and scaling the infrastructure to run your containerized applications. So now that we've looked at the uh, shared responsibility model, let's quickly look at defense in depth. Uh, or the idea of having uh, multiple layers of protection within your environment. 
So you should think of the security model for Kubernetes um, and, and similarly containers like, like an onion. Uh, it consists of various different layers. And at each layer, it's important to have a set of mitigating controls to reduce the overall risk to your environment. Uh, now, this starts uh, with your data, um, and then uh, your configuration, which would include things such as secrets and how you safeguard those secrets. It also involves uh, your source code, the, the dependencies um, that your application has on things like language libraries and uh, the runtime. Uh, then there is the uh, container image itself. Uh, and then finally, uh, the hosts on which your containers run. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to highlight uh, the best practices for implementing security uh, at these various layers, uh, beginning with uh, host security. So the first recommendation here is to use uh, an operating system that is optimized for running containers. Now, this could be uh, the EKS, EKS optimized AMI, um, or it could be uh, Bottle Rocket or another uh, operating system uh, of your choosing that uh, has uh, additional hardening applied to it uh, to improve uh, your overall security posture. Uh, now, Bottle Rocket is a new open source operating system from uh, Amazon and includes such features. Uh, like DM Verity and a read-only root file system along with Secure Boot uh, and SE Linux, uh, all with the purpose of um, you know, mitigating uh, threats uh, and improving your overall uh, security posture. It was really inspired by uh, CoreOS uh, and similar types of operating systems. Um, I list a few here on the slide, such as Atomic and Flatcar Linux, along with Rancher OS that you could also uh, use with EKS. Another uh, important recommendation here is to deploy your workers onto private subnets. Uh, if you uh, want to run a service that, um, it, that needs to accept traffic from the internet, uh, you could expose that service through a, uh, a load balancer uh, rather than deploying your worker nodes onto public subnets. Uh, another thing that you should do is uh, to minimize uh, and audit host access. Now, uh, you can you can do this by making use of uh, Session Manager, which is which is a part of AWS uh, Systems Manager. Uh, the nice thing about Sessions Manager is is that you can control access uh, through IAM. Um, you can use this in place of uh, SSH uh, because uh, those 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 keys uh, need to be secured, otherwise you could potentially uh, compromise the security of uh, your hosts. Um, another recommendation is to use Amazon Inspector uh, to continually assess uh, alignment with best practices and uh, to, uh, to identify vulnerabilities uh, that may evolve over time. Uh, another thing that you can do is run uh, kubebench uh, to look at the alignment with the uh, Kubernetes CIS benchmarks. Uh, and we published a set of uh, CIS benchmarks specifically for EKS. And you can find those by following uh, the link here. And then finally, uh, in, uh, in select environments, it may be necessary to apply additional controls uh, using SE Linux. Uh, now, SE Linux today is supported on operating systems like uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, along with uh, CentOS. Uh, and if you're not familiar with writing SE Linux policies, um, there are a set of tools that you could use, such as Auto to Allow, Auto to Y, and SE Alert, um, that will help you craft uh, those policies. Next, like, let's have a look at uh, image security. So the first thing that uh, you'll want to do here uh, is to scan your container images. Now, ECR uh, provides image scanning. Uh, we happen to be using Claire to scan images, and you can configure ECR uh, to scan those images on push, uh, or you can uh, do an on-demand scan uh, once every 24 hours. 
Um, there are uh, several really good open source uh, alternatives here, including uh, Anchor, uh, Claire, and, and Trivi, uh, which can be integrated with uh, ECR and your CI CD pipelines. Uh, next, you want to use a, uh, a minimal image or create minimal uh, images to reduce the overall uh, attack surface uh, of your container image. Um, now, I ideally, you don't want to include a shell uh, within your image, but for uh, troubleshooting purposes, it is really handy uh, to have that. So uh, instead, you can now use ephemeral containers uh, and kubectl debug um, to inject a, uh, a container into your pod when you need a shell. Um, there are a couple of really good base layers uh, that you can use to create these minimal images, uh, such as Scratch uh, and, uh, and, and Distroless. Now, if you're not able to uh, use those, um, or if you uh, are creating your own set of curated images, uh, it's a good idea to defang those. Um, defanging uh, involves removing files with the set UID uh, and get a GID bits. Uh, and uh, down below, you'll see the command that you can include in your Docker file to uh, remove those types of files. Um, those uh, binaries um, allow you to escalate privileges within the container, which uh, you want to try to avoid. Um, another thing that you want to, to do is uh, to avoid running your application within your container as uh, root. Uh, that happens to be the default, uh, so it's a good idea to add uh, or to check for the user declaration uh, in your Docker files. And there are a couple of really good tools like uh, Hadalint and uh, Dockerlint uh, that you could use to uh, lint those files. And then uh, finally, you want to use uh, endpoint policies uh, and private endpoints with uh, ECR. If ECR is your primary um, registry, um, you, uh, you want to prevent uh, containers uh, from being used to exfiltrate data outside of your organization. Uh, and by creating these endpoint policies, you, you can restrict the accounts uh, to which you can push uh, ECR images. And next, we'll have a look at uh, identity and access management. Uh, we'll start by looking at a couple of general guidelines. Uh, the first is always practice the principle of least privilege. Now, this applies uh, for both AWS IAM and uh, Kubernetes RBAC. Um, <clears throat> you should always try to uh, scope roles uh, to specific AWS resources when you can. Um, you also want to configure your EKS cluster endpoint to be private. Now, by default, it is public. Um, we still require authentication and authorization, so it's not uh, inherently insecure, but nonetheless, um, it is a good idea to configure your uh, EKS cluster endpoint to be, uh, to be private. You also want to periodically uh, audit access uh, to the cluster. Um, you can do this through things like uh, CloudTrail. You'll also want to periodically uh, inspect or uh, to create a rule that detects uh, changes to the AWS auth config map. Um, for IAM specifically, uh, if you have a, a pod, for example, that needs to uh, call an AWS API, uh, you want to make use of IAM roles uh, for service accounts instead of relying on the uh, IAM role that's assigned to the instance uh, that your application is running on. Uh, similarly, you want to block access to uh, EC2 metadata. You don't want pods that are running on an instance to uh, inherit the role assigned to that instance. Each uh, pod that requires uh, access to an AWS API uh, should make use of IRSA or IAM roles for service accounts. For Kubernetes, um, you should use uh, separate service accounts uh, for, for each application, uh, partly because uh, service accounts can be used um, for selector as a selector for uh, security groups or pods uh, or network policies uh, with Calico. Uh, and you also want to disable uh, the mounting of the default service account token, uh, particularly if your, uh, your application does not require access to the Kubernetes API. Now, from a, a pod and runtime security standpoint, um, you can make use of things such as pod security policies 
uh, or the open policy agent uh, with Gatekeeper to implement runtime security measures. Uh, this, include things, this includes things like denying uh, privileged escalation, uh, denying running as root, denying uh, the mounting of host path, uh, or dropping Linux capabilities. Now, um, there are, uh, you will need to create exclusions um, for this. For example, uh, the, a majority of um, container network interfa interfaces, or CNIs, uh, require that you use host, uh, host network. Uh, they also require that you run as uh, privileged. Uh, and, and so uh, you, you may need to uh, create exclusions. Um, also be aware that pod security policies are going to be deprecated in a future release of Kubernetes. So uh, I encourage you to, uh, to look at using alternatives like uh, the open policy agent uh, to implement these policies. Um, now, there may be instances where you, ne you need to um, strengthen security and complement these uh, pod security policies with things like AppArmor or SecComp profiles. Um, you can use these to limit the processes that can run within a container uh, or limit the uh, syscalls that uh, the applications can make to the underlying host kernel. Um, there are a lot of really good uh, runtime security solutions from third parties here. Um, I've listed a few such as uh, Aqua, StackRox, Sysdig, Falco, and, uh, and Twistlock. Uh, I encourage you to, uh, to look at those if you uh, don't want to uh, do this yourself. Now, from an auditing and forensic standpoint, you absolutely want to enable uh, the control plane logs. Um, uh, you, uh, you also want to stream logs from your containers through an external log aggregator. Uh, partly because um, you know, containers are ephemeral, and when uh, they are uh, destroyed or, or, or terminated, uh, the, the logs can be, uh, can be lost. They're not retained unless you stream those logs uh, to an external aggregator. So um, if, you, you know, if, you, if you need evidence um, uh, for a forensics investigation, always uh, en en enable the control plane logs and... Uh, configure your logs to be streamed to an external uh, log aggregator like CloudWatch. Uh, you'll also want to periodically uh, audit um, Kubernetes uh, control plane and uh, AWS CrowdTrail logs for suspicious activity. Um, there are a couple of uh, annotations that get uh, added to the Kubernetes logs, uh, including decision and reason, which will help you ascertain why a particular call was either allowed or denied. Um, and then if you suspect that a, an application or a pod has been compromised, um, you want to immediately isolate uh, those pods. And you can do that by uh, removing or changing the pods labels. Um, you can also create a, uh, a network policy uh, to isolate that pod. Uh, generally speaking, removing, if, if you are making use of network policies, removing the label will automatically remove it from uh, the network policy. Um, that is applied to it, uh, but if you're not and you need to isolate it from other pods, um, then you may have to create a network policy. Um, there's also a, a really nice uh, open source project um, that was developed by the folks at Intuit called Kube Forensics that will help you capture uh, the state um, from, uh, from pods. Uh, and then uh, if it's necessary, you can uh, cordon the instance um, and capture the volatile artifacts uh, on the worker node, uh, such as its memory and, and disk. Now, from a compliance standpoint, EKS has gone through uh, numerous audits uh, that prove that it's compliant with the programs that you see on this chart. Uh, and while compliance is a shared responsibility, uh, this should help alleviate your compliance burden uh, because it demonstrates to auditors that EKS has successfully met the requirements of the various programs that you see here. Now, from a networking security standpoint, it's important to realize that uh, all traffic uh, is, is allowed between pods uh, by default within a, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we, we generally recommend that you use uh, Kubernetes network policies uh, when you want to restrict east-west traffic uh, within the cluster. Uh, 
Uh, you'll typically start with a, a global policy that denies uh, all traffic and then uh, incrementally add policies that allow communication between pods. Um, you'll, uh, you'll likely have a, a rule um, to allow port, uh, port 53 inbound to kube system because that's where uh, core DNS uh, resides and Kubernetes uses that uh, for service discovery. Uh, you then may uh, add another rule that allows all communication between pods uh, within a namespace. Uh, if you want to restrict uh, outbound traffic uh, from pods that uh, don't need to connect to external services, um, you'll, uh, you'll likely use either uh, security groups for pods uh, or a network policy like uh, a network policy engine like Cilium, uh, which has support for layer seven. Um, this is really ideal when you have, uh, say, a, a service that runs within your cluster that needs to communicate with a, um, a, a resource within your VPC, such as uh, RDS, for example. And I'll actually show you an, an example of this uh, later when I get to the demonstration. Um, if you need to encrypt uh, traffic uh, between uh, pods, uh, then you can consider using a service mesh. Uh, majority of service meshes, including app mesh, support TLS. Um, there are uh, alternatives uh, to using a service mesh. Service mesh, um, for example, uh, there are select uh, container network interfaces uh, like WeaveNet uh, that support uh, TLS encryption, um, and there are also a set of Nitro instances uh, that uh, that. Uh, use TLS by default uh, when communicating with uh, with like instances within a VPC. All right, uh, next let me move on to the demonstration. Um, first, I'll explain how security groups for pods works uh, and uh, the different components involved, and then I'll show you a, a brief example of it working. So when uh, a node is bootstrapped, uh, if it supports ENI trunking, uh, the resource controller will update the VPC Amazon AWS.com uh, label from false uh, to true, and uh, it will then attach a, a trunk interface uh, to the node. Um, after enabling pod ENIs, uh, the resource is advertised by the kublet. And as you can see from this uh, little snippet here, uh, this instance has uh, nine pod ENIs or, or branch ENIs available to it. Um, this is in addition to the 29 pods uh, that can be scheduled uh, onto the instance. Now, uh, be aware that uh, max pods for the node does not account for the branch ENIs that a pod can use. Um, pods are, um, are only assigned a branch ENI uh, if they're part of, the, um, part of an AWS security group. So uh, if, if you schedule a pod uh, with a, a label or a service account uh, matching the selector in the security group policy, a uh, mutating webhook will update the pod's resources, that is the, the pod's requests and limits, uh, to reflect that it's being assigned an ENI. Um, and once the scheduler identifies the best node uh, to run the pod on, the resource controller will then attach a branch interface to that node. Um, it also uh, adds a, um, an annotation to the pod uh, with information um, that the CNI will use to configure the pod's uh, network. And uh, this snippet shows the annotation that is uh, added to the pod by the resource controller. Um, it shows uh, how the, the resource uh, um, how the resources for the pod are updated uh, by the webhook. And then uh, in the final step, uh, phase three, uh, the CNI reads the information in the pod's uh, annotation to set up the uh, pod's network. And uh, as part of that, the CNI will uh, create a uh, VLAN uh, dev uh, from, uh, from the trunk CNI. It'll create a route table uh, for the VLAN, um, add a host VF uh, to the route table, uh, and add IP rules uh, for the VLAN host VF uh, to use 
that routing table. Now, uh, you can see these changes for yourself uh, by executing IP route and IP show commands uh, on the instance and from uh, within the pod itself. And uh, this is an excerpt from the CNI logs. Um, it reveals that there was an ENI uh, ad request for the container called uh, Postgres test. Uh, it also shows the information that was used uh, to configure the, the pods network. And in this particular instance, uh, the pod is assigned uh, 10.0.1.167. Okay, uh, so what you're looking at now is uh, a security group, security group policy. Uh, this is being applied to the Postgres test pod. Um, the first security group uh, ID that you see listed here is for the cluster security group. Uh, and the next is for the uh, pod security group. Now these need to be created uh, before uh, you reference them in your uh, security group policy. Um, this is the logs, those are the logs from the, uh, uh, the container and it's issuing a query uh, to a backend RDS database. Uh, now this pod is assigned a security group that allows uh, all traffic uh, outbound uh, and there's another security group rule uh, for RDS uh, that allows traffic uh, inbound uh, from uh, the Postgres test pod. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, remove that rule, and we'll have a look at how that impacts uh, the application. So in a couple of moments, you should see the query timed out. There it is, uh, because I no longer have a rule that allows uh, traffic from the security group that the pod belongs to. Uh, And now I'm going to re-add uh, that rule uh, to allow traffic inbound from the pod's uh, security group. There we are. And I'll save that. And in another moment, we should see the, the query succeed. And there it is. So in that example, you can, uh, you can see uh, how you can make use of security groups for pods to secure or to control traffic between uh, applications that run within your cluster and uh, those that run uh, within your VPC. Um, so I wanna to close today's session uh, by emphasizing that uh, security is really everyone's responsibility. Um, as we saw, uh, securing a containerized environment involves uh, the implement, implementation of controls and, and best practices at different layers of the stack. Um, and be sure, to do, be sure that you're doing your part to help secure the environment. Uh, and part of that involves understanding the, uh, the delineation between uh, the things that you're responsible for and what uh, the provider is responsible for, particularly uh, when it comes to the ECAS data plane. And finally, uh, try to shift security further to the left in your development lifecycle. In other words, um, implement security controls that give developers feedback earlier so they don't in inadvertently deploy an application or a change uh, that compromises the, uh, the security of your, of your cluster and your environment. Uh, before I finish, I want to make you aware of uh, the Security Best Practices Guide. Um, we, uh, we started with security, but we, we also have added content around uh, uh, the cluster autoscaler, and uh, we'll be adding uh, other sections to this guide in the future um, around things such as operational excellence, uh, performance, reliability, uh, and cost optimization. A lot of the content that I shared with you today uh, can be found in this guide along with uh, several other best practices. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.